was just a BA. Yeah. Okay, whatever. All right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, okay. So you won't sit up there for very long. Don't worry. Yeah, go ahead and I'll stop. <laughs> okay. Great. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is John Anderson. I'm a professor of English here at the college. And on behalf of OnQ, Culture and Conversations at QV and the QVCC Humanity Speaker Series. I want to welcome you to our program tonight, Jane Doe No More, Sexual Assault Survivors Fighting for Change, featuring a panel discussion with Dylan Farrow, Susan Campbell, Donna Palumbo, and uh, moderated by Andy Thibault. A significant part of our mission we have for our cultural programming efforts here at QVCC is to engage students and faculty and everyone in the community with a range of truly dynamic programs as a way of educating against all forms of injustice and educating towards open understanding, mutual respect, genuine inquiry, personal growth. Uh, the program that we have here tonight uh, really helps us fulfill that mission. Um, it speaks perfectly to that mission because our speakers in a very direct uh, non uh, unflinching way um, address the historic problem of how power tends to silence those who would speak out against injury. The Jane Doe No More movement, like the Me Too movement, is breaking this silence. Such disruption is necessarily uncomfortable, but we know that often the most transformative educational experiences involve making people feel uncomfortable while also providing support so along those lines, I just want to point out a couple of uh, items to the audience. Um, first, clearly, there's the potential for discomforting or emotionally uh, triggering content. Uh, we have the support of professional volunteers uh, from United Services and the Sexual Assault Crisis Center of Eastern Connecticut. Uh, they are wearing purple carnation boutonnieres and will be stationed in the audience and also outside. Uh, could you guys raise a stand and uh, be acknowledged? Thank you for coming and helping you support this event. Uh, you, you do amazing, important work, um, often behind the scenes. Um, we also have a safe space in room W106, which is out to the right and down the hallway. Um, uh, someone could, uh, can lead you to that. So you know, if you feel the need um, to get support, we have support here. Uh, we cannot, of course, um, assure uh, confidentiality. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. And if you missed it, we have information and resources on the table uh, for you to take with you. Um, furthermore, you can help us in breaking this silence uh, by writing down any questions that you have. Uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a chance for Q&A as the, the, the uh, panelists are speaking. Write down a question. Um, I'll be going around circulating, some of our volunteers circulating and picking up these cards. Uh, so we, it, you know, this is an anonymous process. Um, if I don't see you, um, uh, don't hesitate to, to catch me. Um, uh, oh, uh, by the way, uh, speaking, speaking of uh, breaking silences, this would be a good time to turn off your cell phone um, if, you have, if you have one and haven't, haven't done that yet. Uh, there are many people to thank tonight. Uh, Ginger Bumpus and the maintenance crew did amazing uh, last minute work and uh, making, making up for um, maybe some things I should have given them a heads up on. Um, uh, certainly, uh, we want to thank uh, Carly Drummer and the, the Office of the President uh, and uh, Margie Huapi for all her great work uh, in marketing. But um, also, please turn to the, the program where we uh, print our express gratitude. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Andy Tebow, uh, to whom we, can, we, whom we can thank for uh, being really the lead in, in organizing this. 
Uh, Andy Tebow is a private investigator and author of the award-winning collection of newspaper columns, More Cool Justice. Uh, and he covers federal court for the Reuters International News Service and plans to make a comeback as a professional boxing judge. Uh, he's been uh, hailed by uh, the great historian Howard Zinn as uh, being someone who reminded him of the, the great muckrakers uh, and their work in the early 20th century. Tebow was honored by the Connecticut Council on Freedom of Information in 2014 with the Stephen Collins Award for his, quote, many contributions to the cause of open and accountable government and a free and vigorous press. So uh, welcome to Andy and our panelists. And our Does everybody have a program? Uh, because that has everybody's bio in it. I'll just uh, briefly uh, introduce my colleagues here, uh, starting with, with Donna. Um, Donna Palumba is somebody I've gotten to know in recent weeks as somebody to go to for uh, guidance, insights, and wisdom. She's uh, given me a lot of good counsel as this goes forward. And I know she does that all the time uh, with her organization, Jane Doe No More. And she'll also uh, be signing copies of her book uh, after the event. Um, Susan uh, Campbell, uh, somebody I, I, we worked in the same building now and then a long time ago. And, she always had this uh, aura of somebody who was like on top of things that you shouldn't mess with, you know. And she still has that, you know. And, uh, I admire her and her, her writing and her work. And if you listen to her on NPR, you know, you know she could be anywhere in the major leagues. She, she's that good. Uh, Dylan, I worked on. Uh, the uh, investigation into her case uh, more than 20 years ago and um, through various uh, people and circumstances, uh, we hung out at a diner with Donna a month or two ago and, um, you know, I guess in the past couple years, I don't have the date straight, but you, you've written about uh, me too and who it affects and who it doesn't affect and I, I noticed that uh, there there was people trying to throw a punishment or uh, uh, just I don't know it, it really bothered me and it, it became motivation for me uh, some of the things that were put out there and uh, when she cited some of my work, uh, I, I got a small taste of what she and others who have survived experience, a very small taste. And, and that was also a, a motivation. And uh, I don't really know how to talk about it, but I just uh, um, admire and respect this crew. And I'm really happy to be with you guys. Um, I also want to uh, thank President Carly Drummer. Uh, being here uh, reminds me that teaching is a noble profession and that uh, the legislature is doing a lousy job funding the community college system. And the people here can help straighten that out. Um, I also want to thank uh, my friends and colleagues uh, C.J. McGuffey and Desi Gardner, who are here from Integrated Security Services of Harford, working pro bono to help uh, maintain a certain comfort level for everybody, and I'm grateful for their service and, and friendship. I just want to mention a couple takeaways uh, from what I learned about the case uh, 20 years ago. and. and I did most of my work then, but then a little bit more the past couple years. Um, 
this was a criminal investigation and there was probable cause to make an arrest. That means the state police had enough evidence to charge Woody Allen with a crime. That gets buried uh, in the news sometime. And the, uh, the uh, prosecutor, Frank Mako, and the state police had to deal with uh, not only the acts they investigated, but how, uh, how that would impact a seven-year-old uh, child who had been hurt to go through a trial. And that's why the prosecutor, despite having probable cause, decided not to sign an arrest warrant affidavit. Uh, people are pretty familiar with the headlines about Harvey Weinstein. And it's noteworthy that uh, the fixer for Harvey Weinstein, or lawyer Elkan Abramowitz, is also the fixer, lawyer for Woody Allen. I, I read uh, one of Ronan Farrow, the, he's your kid brother, right? Yeah, your kid brother. Uh, one of the first stories he wrote for The New Yorker when uh, some of the big Hollywood victims decided to trust him to tell their story. Then he did the follow-up. And uh, I don't know how he got this, but I said, wow, Ronan, you, you know. He, he reported that ex-Mossad agents were hired by uh, Elkan Abramowitz to spy on uh, victims of rape, sexual assault, to try to compromise them and actually audio tape them. And I thought, wow. That's really good reporting. Somebody might recognize that, <laughs> which they did when he won the Pulitzer with the uh, other two uh, women reporters from the New York Times. Uh, and I think they all built on each other's work. Uh, in Connecticut, there were many teams, there, there, were, there were several teams of investigators hired uh, by the Woody Allen defense team who uh, tried to dig up dirt on the prosecutor, the state police, the doctors, and uh, the siblings and, and family uh, of Dylan. And uh, there was one goofy guy who was hired, uh, a retired lieutenant, who uh, was well known among troopers. and. Uh, he was supposed to dig up dirt on his, his old friend, a state police detective who had some issues maybe with gambling and booze and, and other things. So he made great money doing this job. He said, hey, I've been hired to dig up dirt on you. <laughs> and then you know, he also told me about it. But seriously, they, they would uh, do things like tail kids to the mall or uh, uh, it was maybe a big coincidence that uh, information leaked out that shut down the state police investigation for about a week. Uh, there was a false claim that a uh, trooper was trying to leak a videotape related to the case, and that, that really gummed up the works. You don't want to shut down a major crime investigation for a week. Um, the, uh, and uh, I talked to Elkan Abramowitz a couple times. He's uh, not intentionally, he was a pretty funny guy. He says, we didn't go into any smear campaign against the state police. Uh, he denied meeting with an investigator. He, he denied meeting with private investigators on the case. And one of the investigators who met with him described him as charismatic. And this is a guy with a lot of juice. I don't know if he makes 800 or 1,000 bucks an hour. Uh, but if you look up the donations to the Manhattan District Attorney, I think you'll see uh, his name and just a coincidence around the time they didn't pursue Harvey Weinstein. The Yale report is often cited. Oh, uh, Woody Allen was cleared by the Yale report. Well, that's incorrect. He was never cleared of criminal wrongdoing. The Yale team was assigned by State's Attorney Frank Mako to determine if the uh, young witness, if her 
demeanor and statements were consistent with someone who had been abused. That's their uh, area of expertise. They're not criminal investigators. In fact, the state police didn't trust them to give them information. That wasn't their job. They had nothing to do with whether there was any criminal wrongdoing. The Yale team not only departed from its mission, they destroyed their notes. That might tell you something. They admitted mistakes. For example, uh, the Yale people claimed that Dylan had loose associations because she said there were dead heads in the attic while her mother kept wigs on mannequins. Then she, they said she had magical thinking because she described the sunset as a, a magic time. So they ultimately uh, admitted those mistakes. And uh, I, I would give that report zero credibility. S certainly has, is irrelevant to any criminal proceeding. So what we're going to hear uh, this evening are stories uh, of what these women experienced, how they, they dealt with it, how they survived, and how they're flourishing in uh, various ways right now. And uh, Don is our leadoff hitter. I'm hoping I can take this off. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Thank you, Andy. And I want to thank the president and John and everyone at Quinnebaug Community College who um, invited us here and set up this wonderful event. Um, as Andy said, I'm going to share my story and talk about what led me to form Jane Doe No More. In 1993, my husband and I were married for 12 years. We had two children, ages five and seven. Life was busy. I was a managing member, a partner in a marketing firm, and my husband was busy in the insurance industry with his three brothers in a family business. Um, in the summer of 93, we were invited to a wedding out in Breckenridge, Colorado. I'm from Connecticut. We were living in Waterbury at the time. We were all going to go and make it a family trip. It was a good friend of my husband's. But as luck would have it, the date of the wedding was September 10th, 1993. And my partner, my business partner's wife, was scheduled to have their first baby. It was a scheduled cesarean section on September 10th, the very day of the wedding. So we made a decision that my husband would go, and I sent him off with well wishes. It was the first time he was away in our then 12 years of marriage. So Friday, September 10th came. I went to work. The children went to school. Um, and a beautiful baby girl was born to my partner's wife. I went to the hospital and was holding this gorgeous 10-pound baby girl at Waterbury Hospital. Then I went and picked up the kids. We went to a children's concert in a neighboring town of Watertown. And we were back home, the three of us, my son, daughter, and myself, by 9 o'clock. I did the usual routine, put them in their PJs, said their prayers, tucked them in. And I was fast asleep by 10 o'clock. The next thing I remember is hearing footsteps. And I was sleeping on my stomach, and I awoke to a masked intruder entering my bedroom. I had no time to react. He jumped me. I screamed. He covered my mouth with his gloved hand, and I bit down on it. He cranked up my arm and said, if you don't cooperate, you're going to get hurt. As I was coming to full awake, I realized that my children would be the only ones that would hear me. He put a pillowcase over my head. He bound my eyes, tied my wrists behind my back. He cut my clothing, and he raped me. He put a gun, the barrel of the gun, to my mouth, and I felt like my head was on fire. He moved the gun from my mouth to my temple, and I literally saw my life flash before me and pictured my children finding me. And I actually said out loud to God, please absolve me of all my sins. And I waited. Amazingly, he flipped me back over and put the gun in my back. And he said, if you call the pigs, I'm going to come back and kill you. 
It was then that I thought I might survive. And I said anything that I could to wheel him down those stairs. I said, listen, this is between you and me. I have no idea who you are. I could never identify you. You didn't hurt me. And miraculously, I heard him walk down the stairs and shut the door behind him. I could not believe I had survived. I was disoriented on the bed. I was tied. And of course, my first thoughts were of my children. I was able to wriggle free from the ties, and I ran down the hall. My son, Johnny's room was first, and he was sleeping, and my daughter's room was at the end of the hall, and she was sleeping. I just knelt down and sobbed, and it was as if angels were watching over them. And my first feeling was gratitude, that they were untouched. And I knew at that moment that if they were untouched and I had survived, that we could get through this. I picked up the phone in our bedroom, and it was dead. I picked up the other landline on the first floor, and it too was dead. If you remember, 1993, not many people had cell phones, and I didn't. And that's when I realized the perpetrator had cut the phone lines. I had to make a decision to run for help because I had no way of communicating with the outside world. I ran to a neighbor's. The neighbor called 911. Unfortunately, right from the get-go, the crime scene was compromised. I had called family members from my neighbor's home that was working. Family members were on the scene. Unfortunately, they were not, the crime scene was not, you know, cordoned off or anything. People were walking up and down, um, and I was in a state of shock. The police were asking me. I was telling them anything I could remember. I remember he was wearing a glove. I remember when he was on me that he smelled like grease or oil. And... Um, my children, though, miraculously slept through the whole thing, even as officers shone flashlights in their faces. One officer that evening suggested I go to the hospital. My eye was throbbing, so I did. I went to the hospital where a sex crimes kit was conducted and DNA from the perpetrator was found. Lacerations were noted on my wrists, and I had suffered a scratched cornea, and my eye was patched. Of course, you live differently after something like this happens. We were staying at my parents' house until my husband returned home the next day, and there were deadbolts on the door that weren't there before that my, hus my brother-in-law had installed, and my husband came flying in, and we had to break the news, and it was devastating. But I assured him that the children didn't hear or see anything, that we were going to be okay, that I was okay. I was back to work within a few days, cooperating fully, and well on my way to healing. I come from a tight-knit Italian family, and everyone was so concerned and so worried, and I really felt like I was making traction, that I was really in a good place. My children were healthy, and we really wanted to make everything as normal as possible for them. One month after the crime, the lieutenant in charge of my case put me in a small interrogation room, turned on a tape recorder, and read me my Miranda rights. I, I said, what are you doing? And he said, why don't you tell me what really happened that night? I was so taken aback. I said, I, I've told you everything I could possibly remember. What are you talking about? And he said, this is serious. We have rock solid evidence that you purposefully lied to the police. I said, please, you have something terribly wrong. I tried to re reason with this man he, to no avail. He harassed me and re-victimized me so brutally. He said, this is serious. You have everything to lose, and I'll never forget. He held up his hand, and he said, your children, your husband, your career, your reputation, unless you tell me right now what happened. I said, please, you, ha you have something so wrong. He said, we have countless interviews and photographs that prove that you are lying. I said, please show me the interviews and photographs. I can explain anything. I've done nothing but tell the truth. This went on, and back then, it was the 30-minute reel-to-reel cassette tapes. I watched him flip it over. Of course, if I knew then what I knew now, I would never have tolerated that. But I was still, I mean, if you think about the horrific incident of the evening, I was traumatized, trying to get through, but still healing. I had post-traumatic stress. And this was just exacerbating it, and I stood there, sat there, and took it over and over. Finally, it was so brutal, 
I, he relayed that my neighbors can't sleep at night because I called 911, and how do I feel about that? That a woman who's nine months pregnant can't sleep because of me? It was just incredible. It was unimaginable to the point where I was crying, and I said to him, what could you be thinking of doing this to me? And he looked at his watch, and he said, I'm thinking of what I'm going to have for lunch. It was devastating. He finally allow, it gave, allowed me to leave under the uh, condition that I would have to come back and confess, and he would close the case that day, or he would find me and arrest me and, my, and be photographed, and, and I would be in the paper the next morning. I went to my parents' house. My father flew out of the house. He found my husband, who was actually dropping our little son, Johnny, who was five years old, at afternoon kindergarten, which was across from the police station. They both went to that lieutenant and demanded to speak with him. In the middle, middle of a busy hallway, my father and my husband were told by him, her story's full of holes, and yes, there is the threat of her arrest. We were devastated as a family. I was always raised with the utmost respect for law enforcement that they were there in your time of need to protect and serve. Thrown into a world we knew nothing about. We ended up reporting his behavior to the captain and we, I knew everything was on the tape. So I said, did you listen to the tape? What is going on? He said he hadn't listened to it. Bottom line, the captain who was his superior, the lieutenant superior, was his brother and they were in collusion and we were secretly tape recorded during that meeting. We ended up getting legal help, thank goodness, and we demanded that an internal affairs investigation be conducted. I was devastated from this. More so than the night of the attack, I couldn't eat or sleep. It just, my healing came to an abrupt halt. But I was determined for my children that I was gonna get through this, and I chose to fight. I demanded that an internal affairs investigation be conducted. And we waited a year and a half to find out that my, my attorney got a one-page report congratulating the officers on a thorough investigation the only, and say, stating that the interrogation method by the lieutenant was in no way improper given the red flags in this case. The only thing the officer was reprimanded for was apparently he hit the tape recorder to the wrong switch and it never recorded. Mind you, he was in charge of technology at the Waterbury Police Department. It was like being punched in the gut. And I was down, but I wasn't out. I picked myself back up and with the loving support of my husband and my family and my colleagues and friends, I fought. And I decided to file suit against these officers. I learned that most victims are under the age of 24 and most will never report because of the stigmas associated with crimes of sexual violence. And I thought, my gosh, this was so difficult. And here I have a loving husband and a family that believes me and supports me. What if it happened to someone younger that didn't have the support that I had? That made me and, and gave me the passion to keep pursuing it. So, um, we finally, it took seven years to go to trial. Seven years they tried to stop me at every turn, but I would not be stopped. I worked with a coalition in the state and created 12 or 13 different items that I wanted to see changed in the Waterbury Police Department so that no other victim would ever have to go through what I did. Finally, in the fall of 2000, we were told the trial would begin in January 2001. Two weeks before trial, I was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer. But I was like a steamroller who could not be stopped. And so I talked to my attorneys and my doctors and we made a careful decision that we would go forward with the trial and then I'd have a subsequent lumpectomy and radiation therapy. So that's what happened. The trial was absolutely brutal. The um, law enforcement officers were represented by two female defense attorneys who questioned everything from my motherhood. How could a woman run out in the middle of the night if there was a mass intruder um, and leave her little children sleeping by themselves? To the terminology I used on the 911 call, it's all recorded, when I said in my state of shock trying to relay information from the neighbor's home, the gentleman that did this to me 
why would she use the word gentleman? That was a big red flag. I, I was in a state of shock, and they were judging my appearance. I learned that there were reports that night that they said, it, literally, she appeared flippant. She was calm. Her house was very neat. And probably the most offensive, one officer that night wrote that I was wearing the nylons that I had been bound with around my neck and my wrist, I didn't even know I had them on, as if they were a stage prop. When I was told by the officer on the 911 call not to remove anything, not to wash, and I simply obeyed orders. It was devastating, and the weight was dripping off of me. The trial lasted a whole month, but finally, Dr. Henry Lee took the stand. He, I had reached out to him, and he talked about the proper handling of a crime scene, how the entire perimeter should have been cordoned off, and photographs and fingerprints taken. And then Dr. David Johnson, who I sought help from at Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Center at Yale, took the stand, and he said that I was a strong person, that I was well on my way to healing, and that that second attack one month after the crime by the lieutenant was in many ways more damaging than the rape itself. And that is why I have post-traumatic stress disorder long-term and will have it for the rest of my life. And then Neil O'Leary, who was headed up a new team of officers, took the stand and he dared to go against his fellow officers. And he said there was never a shred of evidence to prove that I had done anything but tell the truth. And these officers were found negligent. And that was the beginning of an amazing turnaround of events. In 2004, Neil O'Leary went on to become chief of police. And a man in our community, John Regan, attacked a 21-year-old coworker. He tried to sexually assault her. She was able to break free. At the time of the arrest, Neil asked John Regan for a voluntary DNA sample. And he agreed. Two months later, we would find out it was a perfect match to the DNA, in my case, 11 years earlier. John Regan was a man from a prominent family who was leading a double life. He had grown up with my husband since kindergarten. They played football together. He was thought to be a happily married, church-going father of three, and he had everyone fooled. It sent shockwaves throughout the community. He was given the best attorneys that money could buy, and he was out on bond for a year. I didn't know if my husband would find him and kill him, as you can imagine he wanted to, or if he would find me and kill me as he threatened too many times that night. But we never made it to trial because John Regan crossed state lines. He went up to Saratoga Springs, New York, and he sought his next victim, a 17-year-old track star at Saratoga Springs High School. On Halloween night in 2005, he had his Windstar van parked right next to her car. After track practice, everybody split up, and Lindsay went to her car. John Regan opened the van door and grabbed her around the torso and the mouth and tried to pull her into his van. Thankfully, Lindsay is very strong, and she kicked and screamed, and coaches that were in the area heard her cries, and, she came, and they came to her aid. John Regan got back in that van and decided to just drive off on the streets of Saratoga. Thankfully, one of the coaches cornered him. And I'll never forget, Art Cranick was the coach. He said he stopped him, and John Regan was so calm. He said, what are you doing? And Art was like, what do you mean? You just attacked a girl. He said, you got the wrong guy. And Art, in all the confusion, thought he probably had the wrong guy. Thank goodness he held him there. Because the Windstar van was taken into evidence, the back seat was pulled out. There was a tarp, a noose, a syringe, a sedative, $2,500 in cash, pictures of myself, the 21-year-old, and women he had been stalking in New York and Connecticut. That is what it finally took to put John Regan behind bars. And I will tell you that when he was found as a perfect match in my case in 2004, he could not be arrested for the crime because of a statute of limitations that had run out six years earlier. The only thing we had him on was kidnapping, and that was going to be difficult to prove. So this has been quite the journey.
But I have learned so much, and I have met so many amazing people, and the desire to make change has been burning in me. So in 2007, with the love and support of my family and friends, we formed Jane Doe No More. Our mission is to improve the way society responds to victims of sexual violence, to help everyone under understand about this crime, to make it approachable, to be able to talk about it. And I think the Me Too and Time's Up movement has certainly started that discussion. We need to have much more discussion. We need to be in schools, and we've started a safe student initiative where we're in middle schools having crucial conversations with mothers and daughters and fathers and sons about sexual respect. We have self-defense classes for women and girls. And at the heart of our Jane Doe No More programs is our Survivors Speak program. And I met Dylan through our Survivors Speak program in 2014. And we have a couple of survivors in our audience, Patty and Mary, and we've become such a family. Because when you're able to articulate and share your story, you're actually taking some of the control back that the perpetrator stole from you. And at the same time, we're paying it forward to help educate others because we know that most victims will never report. And although it's so prevalent, when you're a victim and you internalize it, it wreaks havoc on your mind and your body. It's a life-changing trauma. We must do a better job. And to know that you're not alone is often all it takes. I founded Jane Doe No More to be a story of hope, to know that you can go on and you can have a wonderful life, but I had to go from victim to warrior to survivor. No victim should have to do that. And so we all need to understand that every John or Jane Doe that's a victim of sexual violence has a future and goals and dreams just like every single one of you. How would you want to be treated? How would you want your wife or your husband for that matter or sister or brother? We need to re-instill human dignity and we need to become active bystanders and all participate in this cause. I will say that in 2007, one of the first things we did is go up to Hartford and I talked to senators and representatives and Governor M. Jody Rell at the time put forth a governor's bill. My case was the impetus for the removal of the statute of limitations on sexual assault cases involving DNA evidence in the state of Connecticut. So that's a big win, thank you. from 2007 going forward. And there is so much work to be done. So if you are a victim, please know that it's not your fault and there is help. It's wonderful to see so many resources and people that are passionate and understand and believe you. And um, I'm gonna leave it there. I know we're gonna have some more discussion and I think I'm gonna turn the mic over to Susan now. I'll, I'll start by saying I'm not much of a public speaker, um, and that way when I'm done, you don't have to turn to the person next to you and say she's not much of a public speaker. <laughs> she knows that already. So I had this memory or this dream that any time I sat quietly as a young adult and a young mother, I would remember a fishing trip that I took with my stepfather and my brother, Tom. And the dream would go, we'd drop our lines in Center Creek near Joplin, Missouri, catch a turtle, let it go, and then my stepfather and I would walk up a hill, and there the memory would stop. And I could never figure out, what a stupid thing to remember, where am I going with this? And I could not remember the rest of the, it was almost like a film reel rolling out. Where, how does the movie end? And I never brought it up with my brother, it was just one of those things. I was selling the house I had bought with my first husband, we had divorced, and it was a sad thing, and I didn't want to sell the house, but I couldn't afford it. As a single mother, I had to sell. And I'm going through boxes, as you do, and I found a, a, a letter I had written to myself when I was 15, turning 16. Who saves this? I did. And I'm reading it, and I think, oh my God, this is exactly the kind of stuff I think about now. And at the time, I'm 28, and I thought, am I ever going to answer these questions? It was sort of like a, you can do it, Susan, letter, which is kind of what I do anyway. And I'm reading it, and suddenly the reel played out, that I knew how that fishing trip ended. It ended with my stepfather raping me on that hill. 
but I couldn't remember it for so long. And then when I remembered that, my first thought was, I am disgusting. Why would I dream that up? And I immediately called my brother, and I said, I don't know what's happening to me, but do you remember a fishing trip? He did not. Okay, well, let me tell you how I think that fishing trip turned out. And I told him, and he said, oh, my God. I have a memory like that, too, with our stepfather, and it stops. And I could never, and we, you know, it's not something you talk about. So my brother had gotten in therapy. I didn't believe in therapy. I'm tough. I'm strong. I can do this. And he said his therapist had told him that day, you know, you act like someone who's been a victim of childhood sexual abuse, to which my brother said, no, not me. And when he told me that, I thought, not me. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm a strong person. I'm okay. I have an irregular family, but we're not, we're not, that, we're not like that. But I couldn't get rid of that memory. And I would go to work, and I was interviewing someone once, and it was a, a, a man, a gentleman, who had abused his child, spanked too hard and gotten in trouble, and had joined um, uh, basically a group to figure out why he was so angry. And I remember asking him a question and saying something about an abusive parent. And he said, I prefer not to call myself an abusive parent. I'd prefer to call myself a parent under stress. And I threw my notebook across the church basement. And I said, God damn it, I'm a parent under stress, but I don't beat my kid. You never do that in interviews. That's not cool. And I left my notebook and went home and thought, that was inappropriate, and I'll be hearing about that tomorrow. And I did. The editor called me in and said, you can't do that. I know. But parent under stress? And I just kept going back to that fishing trip. And I'm not going to therapy. We don't do therapy in my family. My brother might. He's weak. I don't do therapy. But that fishing trip, the fishing trip. And I was divorced at the time and dating this really nice man. And I thought, all right, I'm just going to fly the freak flag a little bit. I'm going to tell him about this trip. And we were rather new together, so I was still trying to be awesome. And we're talking one night, and I said, i got to tell you something, Frank, and I don't even know where I'm going with it. And I told it to him, and he was dead quiet. And I thought, oh, that, that's a deal breaker. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. And he said, you should talk to someone. You should go talk to somebody. You should, you should go into therapy. I don't do therapy. I don't, I'm good. I'm not good. And then there was a day... And my son was outside. He would have been about six at the time. And again, single mother, living in Connecticut. I don't know anybody here. I'm working all kinds of hours, trying to balance everything. And I thought, I'm just going to end it. <laughs> because I'm so tired of living a half-life where I don't feel alive, and I'm not dead yet, and I don't know how to live. I know how to die. So I planned my suicide. And I could hear my son outside, and we do have suicides in my family, and I'm so mad at those people that they would end their lives. One of my uncles killed himself on Christmas Day. Merry Christmas, cousins. And I thought, I can't do that. So I call InfoLine, and I get a nice woman named Mary. And she asked why I called, and I said, I'm going to kill myself unless you talk me out of it. But first, I need to know what your qualifications are. I'm not just your regular suicide sickie. I need to know where you got your degrees. <laughs> I look back at that now, and I'm so glad Mary didn't hang up on me because she could have. And she proceeded to tell me where she'd gotten her degrees, and they passed my very high standards. And I told her everything, first person I ever told everything to. And she put, immediately got me in touch with a talk therapist, immediately got me into group therapy, and then told me a list of books I needed to read. And I'm writing all this down, like, okay, this is my way out. I'm gonna, I built an incest library. When one therapist didn't seem to help, I moved on and got another one. I needed a fresh horse. I went to group therapy. I went to weekend workshops that embarrassed the crap out of me. I'm strong, I'm tough. I don't do inner child. Yes, I do. I filled out the whole workbook and then I went back for phase two. I did everything I could because I could not leave as a legacy yet another suicide in my family for what my grandmother called the miserable drizzlies. Well, we're just sad people. Why? <laughs> we got food. We got cars that mostly start. Why are we sad? And the more I looked and the more forensic evidence I gathered about my family is that 
about 80% of us have been victimized. And about 70% of us turn around and re-victimize. And I remember telling my brother, I will cut my hands off before I will inappropriately touch a child. I'll do it. He stayed in therapy. I stayed in therapy. We call up at the end of the day and tell each other what our respective therapists did. His in Texas, mine here in Connecticut. I was going to live, and I was going to live a full life. There's few things sadder than people who just live sad little lives, especially if they don't even know why. So I decided to live, and then I decided I need to confront. And I'm very clear on this part. Not everybody who lives through childhood sexual abuse needs to confront their perpetrators, but I absolutely did because I was raised fundamentalist Christian and rights right, and you need to explain yourself. So I called up my brother Tom and I said, we're gonna meet on this date, and I hadn't spoken to my mother or her husband, the perpetrator. I asked for radio silence, and I didn't tell her why. I said, I just need a little time, which completely confused her. It didn't, she knew. I had tried to tell a fourth grade teacher at the time this was going on. The sexual abuse went from the time I was about seven until I was 13 when my stepfather gave me a dozen roses and I threw them in the trash. And I'd gone up to Mrs. Wagner in fourth grade and I remember saying, my daddy's hurting me and she sent me back to my desk. Well, okay, I guess that's the way of it. So I'm gonna confront these people. And we set a date, my birthday, 1990. I fly out to Missouri, it's hot in Missouri in July. My brother showed up with a gun. My brother has no business being around a gun. He's the worst shot in the family. <laughs> my father, my biological father showed up, who I, by the way, had told my biological father who was uh, a Vietnam veteran, horribly wounded, mean as a snake, you want him on your side. And he had offered to go and kill my stepfather. We're that kind of people. And I remember telling him, put the phone down. He called a friend in Tulsa to kill my stepfather. And I said, please put, put the phone down. I get to draw fresh blood. I get first blood. Then you can do whatever you want with him. But I think we should let him live with this. So we're sitting at my mother's picnic table, and she's squeezing my hand so hard I can't feel my fingers. And my brother's over here being the Bob Eubanks of confrontation, asking questions, and my stepfather's denying it. My mother takes one look at him. And he did this. And I thought, that's it. OK. She let my hand go. She went running into the house. And I told my perpetrator, you are never to contact me again until you get therapy to admit this happened. And I swear to God, I'm going to follow you. And I'm going to call everyone you, where you volunteer. And you will not have this opportunity again. And I've expended no small amount of energy. At the time, the rules in Missouri was day of discovery. I was too late. They've changed it now. I haven't gone back through court. The man who couldn't remember abusing myself and my brothers now has dementia and can't remember his own name. God's funny that way. But I don't have a half-life. I don't have a relationship with my mother. I don't have a relationship with her husband. It split my family in half and you're on my team or someone else's team. I don't want that. I wish we could talk, but I will not let those people be around my children or my grandchildren ever. And if it seems like I'm someone you don't want to mess with, I was that way as a girl, except as a little girl, you can mess with a little girl or a little boy. But then what I used to tell my parents is I'm going to grow up one day and I didn't mean it as a threat. So I would say, if you're in the audience and you've lived through something, and there's no degree of, oh, mine was worse, yours was worse, it's bad. One incident, one inappropriate touch is bad. You can't compare scars. Just understand you're not alone. There's help, and I stand with you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm rude. <laughs> and now I'll turn the microphone over to Dylan. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> oh. uh, so I, I don't really speak in public very often, so I actually have like notes and stuff. <laughs> I don't do this off the cuff. Um, 
Good evening. My name is Dylan Farrow. And I'm trying to figure out this microphone. OK. <laughs> My name is Dylan Farrow, and I am a survivor of sexual assault. In the past six months, we have all seen remarkable change in how the voices of survivors and victims speak out, and more importantly, are heard. Powerful men from executive vice presidents to senators and state government congressmen to movie producers and actors and directors have finally been exposed. What were once industry secrets and ignored horrors are out in the open. And the message from the women involved has changed. It is no longer the case where the victim of sexual assault has to be on video to win the hearts and minds of others. Our society has finally begun to evolve into one where he said, she said is not enough to throw away an accusation. The truth is not always easily proven, but that's so far only true for women in the public eye. Women who are famous, women who are beautiful, women who either have already enough power to get by if they are blacklisted, or women who are already so broken by their suffering that they have nothing to lose. And in both my case and the cases of numerous others, it's a truth confirmed by a staggering amount of evidence. Yet every day in America, victims of sexual assault face a gauntlet in and out of the courtroom. And even with these truths confirmed or heavily implied with evidence, the assailant often gets the benefit of the doubt. Our culture and most cultures around the world don't want to deal with the realities of sexual assault, child molestation, rape, and every other violation of a woman's body. In Italy, you can be chased out of the country. And in America, you receive death threats, rape threats, and a society that just doesn't want to talk about it. It's too difficult. We can talk about gruesome murders. We can talk about who's cheating on who. But we can't talk about a famous person molesting a child. It's too difficult. And the more powerful and famous the person, the more latitude they have to ruin the accuser's life and, life and credibility. When I was sexually assaulted at the age of seven, I faced a coordinated campaign by my attacker to discredit me, not unlike what other young men and women have experienced. My father hired, by his own lawyer's admission, at least 10 private investigators to dig up dirt on my mother, the police, the prosecutors, and others. He reported both a prosecutor and a custody judge for unsubstantiated ethical violations. He accused my mother of planting the story in my mind. Two decades later, there's more research than ever to discredit the notion that parents can plant memories of sexual abuse. But in the end, he used his wealth and power to escape justice. But all this happened 20 years ago. It's personal and ugly, and it's always felt like a family, family matter being litigated in public. There are so many people out there I didn't realize were in the attic with me and my father. So what's the point of this? Why rehash it again? Believe me, I ask myself the same questions, usually at 3 AM when I can't sleep. And I would like nothing more than to never describe what my family went through again. But I have no choice because to this day, there are people who still believe and promulgate the false narrative that Woody Allen paid a fortune to create. But of course, I'd say that I'm brainwashed. And I don't know the difference between fact and fiction and all the other crazy things he's said. But even with that being the official story, doesn't anyone else find it odd that a court of law declared that a brainwashing, jealous, vengeful, vindictive woman like Mia Farrow would be a better suited parent for me than Woody Allen? <sighs> Since coming forward with my story for the first time as an adult, I've faced a barrage of threats, slurs, and insults, some from strangers and some, more painfully, from artists I admired. Scarlett Johansson called me irresponsible. Stephen King accused me of palpable bitchery, and I got that on a t-shirt. Even after my story was examined in great detail recently, Javier Bardem, Alec Baldwin, Kate Blanchett still refuse to believe it unless video evidence is presented or a judge unequivocally says so. Most of what I saw after coming forward repeated old distort distortions that are easily debunked. People are quick to point as Andy said, to a widely discredited 1993 report by Yale psychiatrist John Leventhal that concluded that no abuse had taken place. 
The author of that report relied on psychologists on Woody Allen's payroll to make his conclusions, but never met me. His team refused to interview witnesses who had seen me being molested by my father. The night before the report was issued, the author met privately with Allen's legal team, and they later destroyed all their notes without explanation. But Leventhal, the only doctor involved in the report, never once met me or my mother. After filing the report, Leventhal's team destroyed all of its notes and even admitted that he would never have con conducted himself that, that way again. At the time, the report was discredited by Connecticut police investigators and disregarded by a judge. My story was among the first to get such national coverage as there, are no regulations in, as there were no regulations in how a child victim should be handled. Today, no evaluation of a child victim would ever be carried out in this matter. And the report is a travesty and a reminder of how much has changed for the better this past few decades. It is never, ever to be quoted as a responsible source of information. It was tossed out of court for a reason. Also, why would anyone take the word of a doctor who had never met me over my own? The other attacks are remarkable for how little they actually have to do with me. They instead focus on my mother, who hasn't spoken about this matter in years, except to briefly tweet support for me, and has never encouraged me to speak out. The first time we actually did discuss it together was right before I wrote my first essay in 2014 for the New York Times. Many Woody Allen fans lead with a statement of support that my mother offered for Roman Polanski in the 1970s. For anyone curious, she hasn't supported him in the present day since knowing his case facts. They salaciously open, offer up my estranged brother, Moses. They add that my mother's brother was convicted of sexual assault, and she, in fact, testified against him. Others point out that Alan Dershowitz, a lawyer represented her decades ago, faces his own allegations. I have seen multi-paragraph audits of my mother's sexual history used in defense of the man who assaulted me. My story is just like those of many other victims who've had themselves and their families dragged in the dirt. When actresses initially came out against Harvey Weinstein decades ago, they were shunned, blackballed, and the entire discussion tossed aside because they, they obviously used the casting couch to further their careers. And that, I suppose, is just the, bit, the facts of doing business in Hollywood. When the assault isn't filmed or photographed, it's often treated as simply fictitious. They jump through hoops to rewrite the scene and explain away the truth. So many people have tried to rewrite what happened to me in the attic. This takes the shape of so many campaigns to silence victims. It focuses on everything except me, an adult woman with her own family, career, ideas, with nothing to gain from coming forward except that the truth will help others. After the Me Too movement kicked off, we saw our cause move several steps forward for the first time ever. Women were being listened to, women were being heard, and just as difficult in American culture, men were speaking up too, men like Terry Crews. But this only works with those for high, with high profile, those who can muster not evidence but public support, because unless the perpetrator can be shamed or perceived as a liability, they will not get punishment. Some things haven't changed at all. Right now, there are victims of rape and sexual abuse deciding whether or not to pick up the phone and call the police or tell a partner or a parent. They fear they won't be believed. They fear the trauma of re-victimization. They fear that their parents or family members may side with their attacker, which happens a lot. They fear that their jobs will be terminated. They fear the police will arrive with doubt and immediately decide the case is closed before it's ever opened. They fear that their attacker will successfully malign their character, their personal history, their mental stability, their family. They fear being embarrassed and ashamed, and that's why I keep dredging up my own horror, why I stand up and force myself to relive the attack over and over. This is why I lose a whole month of sleep leading up to these events with, with anxiety and nightmares, because I want these survivors to see that coming forward is painful, but ultimately worth it. Anyone accused of a crime is free, and rightly so, to mount the best defense they can. But as a society, we can decide the experience and support that victims feel when they tell their stories. And we fail those victims when we tolerate campaigns to destroy them and those who come forward in their support. This is one of the most disingenuous forms of silencing and shaming that victims of a sexual assault can face. 
It's an attempt to rip apart their character and credibility dressed up as an attack on anyone who stands by them. I know why they would do that. It's much easier to attack people who haven't been abused. But I've seen a few prominent journalists and artists take this seriously, and they're welcome to do so, but it's important to have the facts. There can be a debate about Woody Allen's films or art versus the artists, but when you attack me or my family, when you mislead and distort for the sake of an argument you wish were true, that's not just an attack on us. It's part and parcel of a culture that leads victims to believe they will never be heard, that it, was, that it would be better if everyone just stayed silent and let people get away with these crimes. And I'm not suggesting that we build a culture where people accused of crimes don't have their right to defend themselves or where we believe people without evidence. But we can choose not to tolerate the wholesale demolition of victims, especially the insidious form that comes through the shaming and haranguing of mothers and family members. We can build a culture that doesn't make speaking up so agonizing for sexual abuse survivors that they wish that they had just cried in their beds and never told anyone. And to any survivors out there right now, considering whether or not to come forward, please know that for all the evil in the world that you've experienced and all the pain ahead and all the people who defend a monster because their egos are tied up in some vision that they've created for themselves, there is a web of kindness that you only get to see when you speak up and it will save you. And there are prosecutors who will fight for you as a man named Fra Frank Mako did in my case and judges like Elliot Wilk there are reporters who expose the truth, like Andy Tebow, who I'm grateful to have brought me here today. Other reporters like Maureen Orth or Nicholas Kristoff. And many others like my brother, Ronan Farrow, who are part of a new generation. There's family members like my mother, who is a goddamn living hero. And my other siblings who have stood by me and help me not move past what happened, but also find my voice. And there are brave men and women who have reached out by the hundreds to share stories with me. I hate talking about sexual assault. We all do. But I'll do it as long as it sends the message to other victims that you can and should come forward. None of us are alone, and thank goodness. Me Too is not done. We have a long way to go. Silence in the face of adversity still persists. Men and women and children are shamed, afraid. We don't have the proper infrastructure to investigate and support them. And it shouldn't take getting thousands of people shouting on Twitter to get a case seriously looked at. It shouldn't take national coverage to have things happen in big numbers. It shouldn't be shrugged aside when woman after woman accuses someone. And it shouldn't take 70 women to take down someone in the first place. We're not there yet, but we're closer. This can change, and it's up to all of us to fight for these changes. It used to be that standing up to sexual abuse was about being a candle in the dark, but that's not true anymore. Because when there are enough candles, there's not, nowhere that the light can't find. No one wants to look backward. I say this, looking forward, hopeful for the culture that my daughter will grow up in one where no one is afraid to speak the truth. Thank you. Well, I think we all need a break, but uh, I also want to thank the, the women and men of the American Legion for coming tonight. They have a Me Too and the women vets and they got the hats, and thanks for coming. Um, do we have any cards? Okay. Well, uh, yeah. Let me just uh, ask the panel. Um, do any of you want to react to what one of the others had to say? Or, uh, uh, Whew. or you know, you, you've done enough already. <laughs> Is that me? That might be me. I don't know. 
No. Okay. You can come up here if you want to do something. No, no, I was just making sure that my mic wasn't. Okay. Susan, you are a very good speaker. <laughs> See, when you set expectations low like that, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, but everybody knew that already. Very kind. Okay. Can I respond? I, I am bowled over by these women. I was, I'm humbled to be here. Um, we all have dealt with our issues. We've all dealt with abuse and assault in different ways. And I look at someone like Dylan and having to do it in public is just takes an incredible amount of strength and courage. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, just an observation that uh, toward the end of your talk, Dylan, uh, Susan gave me an elbow and said that that's the home run because uh, <laughs> I think you put in perspective uh, where uh, the current trend is towards the end of your talk. Thank you. Very much. Well, over the past few months, it's been kind of intense, and I was kind of living on Twitter for a little bit. Um, and seeing the, the, the difference between the response to my accusations now in the post Me Too climate versus before when I first came forward as an adult in 2014 when I wrote my piece for Nick Kristoff's column, the difference is just night and day. I mean, the support versus the lack of support um, was unbelievable. And uh, it, 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 it really, I think, changed my, a lot of my outlook on, on things. Um, going forward, and I also think, you know, we still have a ways to go. Well, uh, here's um, a, a point that will uh, give the panel members pause, I think, and I think you'll be able to offer some feedback. Dear panel, I only have partial memories of my father's touching, full memory of my mother's denial. Why is it so difficult to admit I was abused? Thank you. On the part of the mother? Um, it's, why is it so difficult to admit I was abused? Or I think grammatically it, you might need to do something with it, but I think why it is suggests it that the, why doesn't the mother believe, I think is, the question, why doesn't the mother admit I was abused? My mother will go to her grave believing, one, that Richard Nixon was framed, and two, that she married a good man. And she married a man who shouldn't have raised chickens, but he raised four children and he abused every last one of us. But she has to create in her mind this perfect world because her world is absolutely imperfect. And I don't excuse her for it. I don't hate her for it. But I think if she were to ever tell the truth about this, it would destroy her. And she has a very heightened sense of survival. In the case of having partial memories, me too, um, I had recovered memories, which were really like being crashed by a wave onto rocks. I would only remember a little bit. And I think your mind is trying to protect you. And you will remember when you're ready and not a moment before I, I couldn't have dealt with it if, if the questioner is referring to him or herself. I couldn't have dealt with the whole memory until I actually did. I'd just like to comment too that, um, Susan, that's, that's very common and a lot of the survivors on our Survivor Speak team of which there's 46, over 70 percent are victims of child sexual abuse and I'm thinking of Deb Mitchell in particular and how she was abused by her father uh, for many, many years, beginning, I think, at age four or five. And 
she tucked that away just for survival and it didn't come forward until she was in her 40s, married with children, mm -hmm. and at 47 all of a sudden there was a trigger. And for whatever reason, these memories are repressed. And I think it's important to note that because of the statutes of limitations that then prevent anyone from getting justice. So I think it's just so important that we learn and understand more about this crime and what trauma looks like and how it, how it acts. I have another question here. Do you worry that in the moment in, I'm sorry, do you worry that in the movement to break silence and do what's right, that innocent people, without getting a trial, are going to have their lives ruined? I think that if you're innocent, you have nothing to worry about, right? Are you like a court of public opinion? I do, I do worry about that. We do have due process, and everyone is entitled. Of course. I, in the situation where it's overwhelming, Harvey, I have a hard time worrying about his career. Yeah. I think I'm definitely playing the world's smallest violin for Harvey <laughs> Weinstein, personally. Um, I think that in a lot of these cases, somebody innocent, how often has that happened versus mm -hmm. The opposite. I mean, have, have we yet uncovered somebody who was wrongfully mm -hmm. accused in the court of public opinion? I think in most of these cases, when we find out about someone, our first reaction is like, oh, I kind of had a feeling about that guy. Um, at least, at least for me. <laughs> It's like Dylan said, so many people who come forward, this, it's not to sit on a stage and talk to a sympathetic audience. That's not what you normally get. You get remonstrations, you get called names, you get called a liar. It's true. Who would sign up for that? And, and that's not saying that it doesn't happen, but not that often. It's an infinitesimal amount of people who make stuff up in exactly. this realm. Exactly. You, you, you said it much better than... Not at all. <laughs> no, no, it's true though, but that's what people will hang on to. Oh, remember? And that one? Yeah. That one guy. But no, I think, I mean, having lived through the gauntlet <laughs> that I spoke about and uh, having faced what I have faced for coming forward, I, I mean, I really have trouble thinking about who in, who in their right mind <laughs> would set themselves up to accuse somebody innocent so that all of their supporters can come down on them with death threats and suicide baiting. And I mean, I've gotten some very bizarre Twitter messages about how I'm going to be unbrainwashed someday. I mean, it's really, I mean, I don't wish that on anyone. And I can't believe that there's somebody out there who's like, oh, I know what I'm gonna do today. I'm gonna have lunch, and then I'm gonna accuse so-and-so of rape so that I can face down all of the people who won't believe me and all of the people who are gonna come after me and all the people who are gonna insult my mother and all the people, I mean, really? Sorry. <laughs> Dylan mentioned a web of kindness, and here's why I'm glad I'm old. Because when I wrote about my childhood sexual abuse, um, it was for Northeast Magazine with Hartford Current in 93. This was pre-social media, the blessing and curse that is social media. And I braced for it. Um, it ran on a Sunday, and that, that week before, I just, I didn't sleep. It was like this. It was just, oh, it's going to hit the fan now. And um, I remember, this was before social media, so you either had to pick up a phone, write a letter, or send me an email. A lot of effort there. And I got 700 plus responses to that article. Two respectfully questioned whether I had made it up. Respectfully, they did, I'm not kidding. And I, I answered everybody. The overwhelming response was me too. This happened to me too. And it just, I didn't write about it again for 20 plus years. It was overwhelming. But the web of kindness that you mentioned, I walked right into it and didn't expect it. I had overwhelming support from people I'd never met. And 
I wish we could get to that and disarm the trolls. Who, yes. Yeah, they're in their mommy's basement covered in Cheetos dust, and they think they get to say whatever they want. And it's like carving off a little piece of yourself when you talk about this stuff. And, you know, we don't need medals, but instead to get this ridiculous, these ridiculous accusations from people who don't even use their real names is stunning. I would also like to add that, um, you know, I think Me Too is definitely a start, but we need more men engaged in the conversation. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough men who are standing up and talking about this. And so, you know, I think we have to have father-son conversations. We have to start early about sexual respect and that no one has the right to take control over you. And we also need to talk about consent and what consent looks like and right. verbal and nonverbal cues. There's so much to be learned to be able to prevent this cycle from, from continuing because it's so detrimental. I think tacking on to what Donna just said, I think in opening the conversation to men, guys, your first response can't be defensive. Mm. You need, this is your chance to sit down and listen. It's not an accusation. We're not saying that you're all terrible people. We're not saying that you're all rapists, but to carry on the conversation, it is so important that you don't just shoot us down. Don't be Alec Baldwin. Thank you. I am so disappointed in him. Me too. Oh Me too. That, that was awful. I'm, I was just really glad that I binge watched uh, 30 Rock before, before. <laughs> all of that. I never have to do that again. Yes, and now I never have to do it again. I love Tina Fey, though. My God, she's awesome. Here's another question. What do you think caused this sea change of women, women coming forward? Well, Tawana Burke started it 13 years ago in Philadelphia. She's an African-American activist, and she started Me Too. She didn't get any credit for it. I really think it was famous, beautiful people. Yeah. Taking, taking up the mantle or picking yeah. up the sword. I mean, I, I, I also think that um, there, there was a point back, I was pregnant, so it was probably about two years ago, uh, when my brother wrote a piece in support of me for The Hollywood Reporter. And in a lot of ways, I saw a lot of support after that. And, in a, and my reaction was, in a lot of ways, two folds. Because on the one hand, I was so grateful to my brother, Ronan, who is an amazing journalist, um, obviously. Because he, he won a little award or something this week. <laughs> um, and, you know, on the tail end of feeling that pride and support from my brother, there was this very sort of salty question that came to the surface of why does it take a white man having to repeat my story for it to be believed? Why wasn't that just the first reaction? Um, and Again, it ties back into bringing men into the conversation, I think. But um, that's that. That was also a a factor for me. That uh, I think people, men especially, were willing. People listen to white men. <laughs> Who knew? So uh, white men, step up. How about a little support here? <laughs> I'm struggling to, to follow this one, but I think the gist of it is um, what can be done on behalf of a, a young child that was in a assault situation and the alleged perpetrator hasn't been held accountable for uh, evaluations or tests? What can you do when the doors are shut? <sighs> is what I take from this. Well, when I was seven years old, and I, yeah, just been assaulted, I mean, in the attic at least, and I was starting to come to terms with the fact that 
what happened in the attic was not an isolated incident, that I had actually been systematically molested and groomed my entire life. Um, I think what I probably needed most was you know, kindness, support, healing, maybe, you know, somebody offering for me never to have to speak about it again. And instead, I was dragged all over the state of Connecticut <laughs> to repeat my story over and over and over. Um, and I, I mean, that was probably not the best thing for me. I mean, I think for, for a little kid, let them be a kid. Let them try and reclaim a part of what was taken from them, part that I'm never getting back. I think kids need compassion and they need understanding and they need help. And I think as adults, as an adult, <laughs> as a recent mother, if I found out that this happened to my daughter, I, I think my first question would be, what do you need? I don't want to decide that for her. Or any child, I think you know they know, they know what they need. So I think that that is what they should be given. Okay, we got another one. Uh, what key changes are you looking for in the future in terms of legislation, changes in society, et cetera? Whoa! In the patriarchy. <laughs> Start the matriarchy? No, I'm just kidding about that last part. I think every state should re-examine its day of discovery and statute of limitation yes. laws, as you said. I agree with that. I think, too, we need to make the topic approachable. Hmm. I think there, you know, as Jane don't know more, just going out and speaking to different folks, some are really close-minded because it's such a tough topic. And it's like, you know, I think our group would rather, you know, do something with the arts or culture, and you know, that's a little bit too heavy for our group. And and people like that don't believe that it, it happens in their circle, but this happens everywhere. The crimes of sexual violence know no geographic or demographic. It's everywhere. And when people say to me, you know, I'm fortunate, no one that I know is a victim. Hmm. I just smile and say that that has come out and told you. Chances are you do know them. And, and then they haven't come forward because we don't live in a culture that makes it easy for a victim to come forward. Look what happened in my case. Yeah. But I would tell anyone to still go forward. Today is, is a new day. You could certainly go to the hospital and then decide if you're going to report or not. And again, like. Dylan said, it's your choice always, what works for you. But there are always resources now. And um, the most important thing is telling someone. And if they don't believe you, you keep telling until you are believed. Don't internalize this. And help others to understand about this so that more men and women will look out. If they are ever approached, they'll listen. They'll help that person get to safety. It's really, I think, one of the biggest issues in our time. And we all need to open up to be able to understand it better, help break the stigmas, and be a voice to change things. And I think also uh, starting that as early as possible. I mean, when you think about the terminology I used as a seven-year-old to describe what happened to me, I mean, I had no concept of what a vagina actually was medically speaking. I mean, we need to talk to our kids about it. Maybe not in such heavy terms like at right off the bat, but the more we speak to them, the easier it'll be for them to speak to us. I think we're at a wrap with questions. And as a listener, I would just share that uh, I'm still stunned by the power of each presentation. And uh, thank you for telling your stories. Thank you. Thank you. You gonna do a closing thank remarks? You. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Susan and Donna. Uh, this is very, very powerful. Um, I also wanna thank the audience because you could have just gone out and enjoyed this uh, beautiful night before the rain comes, you could have gone to a movie, but you decided to come here and sit with something that's very difficult and very challenging. And um, uh, I know that I want to, um, and I hope that we all will carry the power of what you share.
shared with us. And I'll take the reins next. So thank you all. And Donna will be signing copies of Jane Doan, no more. Out there probably, right? Or where? Yeah, okay.